right, so next up, we have Jacob Plick for some fun SLOs, SLIs, and where to find them. So uh, let's take it away, Jacob. Appreciate it, Sam. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody, or wherever you are in the world. We're watching this later. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, as Sam mentioned, my name is Jacob Plick. Um, I'm a senior cloud integrations engineer here at Grafana Labs. Um, I've been in the reliability space for the past seven plus years or so, working either at or with a bunch of different companies across uh, retail, e-commerce, finance, airlines, you name it, insurance, um, either on reliability, chaos engineering, or um, observability. So uh, let's get into uh, SLOs, SLIs, and where to find them. So I'm sure many of you actually have seen the uh, abbreviations uh, before, but just to make sure that uh, we touch on the concepts of everything, uh, SLIs are your sort of carefully chosen monitoring metrics that measure uh, an aspect of a service's reliability. So ideally, your SLI should have a close linear relationship with your user's experience of that reliability, uh, typically the number of good events divided by the count of all valid events, which looks a little bit like this. So you want to express your SLIs as the proportion of a set of events that were considered good. So expressing all of your SLIs in this form has um, a few really good properties. Uh, so firstly, your SLIs fall between zero and 100%, where 0% means nothing works, and everything's bad, uh, and 100% means nothing is broken, which is you know, great. So this scale is easily uh, intuitive and directly translates to percentage reliability, SLO targets, and error budgets, which we'll get into in a second. So secondly, your SLIs have a pretty consistent format, uh, which can serve as an interface for uh, abstraction, abstraction. So the consistency allows you to build you know, tooling around these SLIs. Think alerting logic, error budget ca calculations, and different um, analysis and reporting that you can do. Um, and you can actually, uh, these could all be written to expect the same inputs, good events, valid, valid events, and your SLO threshold. But what do we mean by valid? And why don't we use all events in the SLI equation? So sometimes you may need to exclude some events recorded by your underlying metrics from being included in your SLI. So they don't consume your error budget. Uh, so a good example here might be ignoring 300 and 400 HTTP response codes as irrelevant to your overall SLO performance. So this phrasing allows us to make this exclusion really, really explicit and specific by declaring those events as invalid. So I've kind of put together this little SLI menu, if you will. Um, there's a lot of different ways uh, for folks to really get started with this. Um, for the most part, availability and latency is a really, really solid place to, to start. But you want to be thinking about these types of questions. What are the user's expectations for the, the reliability of the service, whether they're internal to you and your company or an external uh, customer of yours? How can we measure the user's experience versus these expectations with, uh, in this case, Grafana, for example? Um, and how does the user interact with our service? So switching gears to SLOs, um, we take that SLI and we apply a target reliability to it. So if you express your SLIs using the equation I just mentioned, your SLOs will generally be somewhere just short of 100% or for example, 99.9, .9, or as it's commonly known, the three nines. But the most important feature of any system is its reliability. So you can easily lose the trust and respect of your users if your service becomes too unreliable, or if it's simply perceived as being too unreliable. Uh, so these countless hours you spent designing and building things to make the most incredible, amazing user experience um, is all for nothing if your user can't access them. So unreliability can have pretty disastrous con consequences for your business, of course. So competitors will snap up your current dissatisfied users and your poor reputation will show, will, will show, slow things down and even halt the acquisition of new users. But it's not enough to just declare that our services must be more reliable. Frankly, if that worked, we would probably be really, really bored and uh, we'd have no engineering fun things to do to, and to figure out. So uh, reliability is actually a shared goal that many different parts of an organization must work toward together. And many companies, it's common to separate this um, responsibility from 
operate for operating a service from that of building, say, new features for it. This allows people in each role to specialize, but it alters their priorities in a way that can often cause conflict. So pretty commonly, the situation when in a negative space looks a little bit like this. So the development team for a service decides to focus on feature iteration and speed and adopting practices like Agile and push on green to accelerate planning and release cycles. This increases the burden on service operators who are now scrambling to catch up with a steady stream of these beta features making their way into production. And then inevitably, something gets pushed before it's quite production ready, leading to an unfortunate, very visible outage, and then lots of customers shouting at them on social media, which isn't great. Then the operations team reacts by setting up procedures to protect the production environment from all this terrible outage-inducing change, and now we're slowing developers down and making them set. So to avoid this scenario, um, an organization needs to find a way to incentivize the developers and operators of a service to cooperate together. So that way we can build new features without regularly suffering these serious reputation damaging outages. But of course, we can't spend all of our engineering time on reliability because reliability isn't a standalone product. So the question we end up asking ourselves is what is reliable enough? shortly followed by how can I objectively measure the reliability of my service. So that's where SLOs come in. Um, they're a really principled way to agree on the desired reliability of a service. Now, they can provide different value to different parts of our organization. So we've claimed reliability is the most important feature, but say for the product-oriented folks, this brings up a really difficult question. So when should engineering for increased reliability take priority over that shiny new feature you've been designing for a really long time? If you have an agreed upon and widely communicated target for service reliability, you can answer that question with objective data. For the devs in the room, uh, reliability work can get in the way of hacking on these super cool new projects that you're really excited about, meaning those ridiculous deadlines set by the products folks. Weak nudge, no offense product folks. So changing systems is the biggest risk to their reliability. So how do you strike a good balance between moving fast and breaking things? If you have a real-time measure of service reliability, you can start to gauge the reliability cost of new code. You actually know when one of your shiny new features has hurt your users instead of letting them. And then for the ops folks, um, like myself in the room, we are generally on the hook for a service's reliability, agreeing that some measure of unreliability is actually acceptable and even desirable, usually helps reduce the overall operational burden of that service. So rather than burning yourselves out fighting every small fire, guilty as charged, been there, done that, plenty of stories to tell, you can carve out time to work on proactive projects that stop things from catching on fire in the first place. So that's where SLOs provide us this common language and shared understanding, allowing us to anchor the conversation about service reliability on concrete data. Now, it's one thing to catch on is, it's tempting to consider SLOs to be purely operational um, and their operational concern, I should say, but for them to function correctly, there needs to be that Venn diagram of everyone. Um, and it's a good signal for prioritizing engineering work. So that way your reliability targets must be set in conjunction with engineering and product teams. So everyone's agreeing on the target accurately that often ends up representing the desired uh, experience for everyone, which is awesome and sort of the point. But what does being reliable in the context of an internet service really mean? So what should we be able to do? Um, what characteristics are important to us? What are the expectations of how a service should respond? In Netflix's case, um, I click play, my movie works. I go to Google, I can search things. Now, of course, we're in very much live in a world where um, we want everything right away immediately, but we can sort of tweak this. So if your service has these, has paying customers, um, you can probably, you probably have some way of compensating them with refunds or credits when that service has an outage. So your criteria for compensation um, is usually written to an SLA or service level agreement, which describes the minimum level of service that you, pro you promise to provide and what happens when you break it. But the problem with SLAs is that you're only incentivized to promise the minimum level of service and compensation that would stop your customers from jumping ship to somebody else. Um, so, and also compensating your customers all the time can get really expensive. So what targets do you hold yourself to internally, for example? 
When does your monitoring system trigger an operational response is another. Do you have the breathing room to detect problems and take remedial action before things get really bad and public facing reputation is a concern? A few things to think about. So another way of looking at an SLO is it helps you answer, what do we need to make a service more reliable? But really, it's really all about where do we draw the line? So we've talked a lot about SLO targets and that they should be decently higher than the reliability that your SLAs are promising. But this obviously doesn't help many free services that are funded by, say, advertising that don't really have a user-facing agreement at all. So how reliable is reliable enough? And how do we measure how far off the target level? And then what do we do when we are, we're missing the target? So one thing to think about, that's kind of a catch all here is you may want to think that you should set your targets as high as possible to serve your users as best as you can. This is not a good thing. 100% is the wrong reliability target for pretty much everything for the most part. That's even true in the case of things like pacemakers. Um, there was this paper I found uh, in, that was published in 20, uh, 2005. Uh, that had an average reliability of around 99.6. So think about that when you're talking about or going to the business or having someone from the business talk to you about a 99.999 um, objective um, and gives you some ability to push back a bit. Um, so also at some point before you reach 100% of reliability, there's this trade-off that happens that's no longer worth making because now the costs significantly outweigh the benefits. So there's a really good rule of thumb for where SLO targets should be generally. Typically, a user of your service should be just about happy with the service where it's operating at those targets. If it was any less reliable, you'd no longer be meeting their expectations and they start to become unhappy, thus the happiness test. So the challenge, of course, is quantifying and measuring this happiness because measuring it directly tends to require the kind of invasive medical procedures that customers aren't really willing to consent to. So it's bad if you're meeting all your SLOs and customers are unhappy. So that's something to look into. If you have, um, if you can, if you have to make sure you're thinking about all different groups, your mobile customers, desktop, different geographies, um, because the impact of an incident or an outage may not be spread equally, but SLOs are generally aggregates across your entire user base. So if one customer is getting all your error budget, they're probably not super duper happy. That's where area budgets, of course, come in. So if we're not targeting 100% reliability, then whatever target we do set is, we wanna make sure it allows for small amounts of errors to be served to our users. Now, if everyone agrees that an SLO target represents the point at which users start to become unhappy with the reliability of a service, we can pretty much um, assume that serving errors beyond that point without, um, we can theoretically, oh, sorry, we can theoretically serve errors beyond that point without impacting user happiness. So if you set a three nines target, for example, that means you can serve one error in every 1000 requests to your users, a little bit of availability math. Or in terms of a complete downtime situation, your service can be unavailable for a little over 40 minutes in about a four week period. So rather than just passively measuring the SLO um, and potentially exceeding it without really knowing, you wanna make sure that this is something that you're on top of and we can make sure to treat the acceptable unreliability as a budget. That way we can spend that budget on different development and operational activities. For example, uh, we can focus on getting that new super new, really cool feature out really quickly, um, or have and understand this acceptable piece of, of, of downtime, or do some experimentation, like doing some chaos engineering experiments and testing things out before things go wrong, my personal favorite. So lastly, what does this look like today at Grafana? So here we have, uh, we actually have a weekly report that goes out to pretty much everybody in Grafana Cloud around our SLOs. And there we go, that should be going now. Whoops, I accidentally paused it. There we are. Um, and I selected the integrations uh, SLO here because that one directly impacts me. If this one's having uh, an incident, then I can't work on new integrations and get them out to customers. So that's not awesome. But this is the, that was the prompt QL a little bit. I'm going a little fast here. Go back a sec. There we go. Make sure you see it. That's the PromQL uh, query that we're using for that one. And that's using the SLI metric that, uh, or calculation, I should say, that I mentioned a little earlier. 
And then a little bit on the synthetic monitoring side of things, um, we actually have a few different um, SLOs for this. Reachability being kind of asking if everybody can reach the target, and then uptime asking if anybody can reach the target. Uh, so the first screen was essentially showing everything hunky dory, and the second shows a bit of an incident in uh, Mumbai, uh, India, of all places. Um, and as we can see, uh, that actually impacted our reachability. And as we kind of dig in, we can see that we had a few weird sort of TLS issues um, that happened um, after uh, after a push one day. So I know that was a lot to get through um, and a lot to unpack and really just an intro, to, if I'm being honest. Uh, so there's a bunch of additional resources uh, that you can you can take a look at. Uh, Google, of course, wrote the book on SRE uh, in a lot of cases. As a matter of fact, they're, all these guys are right here. Uh, so take a look at those. Um, personal favorite would have to be implementing SLOs by Alex Hildago, uh, really, really awesome guy. And uh, we have a blog about SLOs and uh, as well as many more things to come. So uh, thanks for hanging out and listening. And of course, if you have any questions, fire away at will, I should say. Sam, back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jacob. So um, one question I had is like, when when do you, when when is it okay to retire an SLO or reconsider it? Because I think a lot change can change as the company scales up. Mm -hmm. um, so what what your what your SLIs are even as a startup versus when your company's growing a lot can change. So what are what are some signs of growing pains with with SLOs and SLIs? Yeah, yeah. I think from an um, availability and a latency perspective, that's one that's kind of always moving as you're as you're scaling up. Um, I think where things get really interesting is when we start thinking of throughput and, and speed, um, because now we, we actually, as we scale, we have more pieces of infrastructure in which to sort of play with and deal with requests. So the likelihood you have it really, really tight and then it sort of loosens up over, over time. So um, I, I think what's, what's interesting, at least in my, my learnings with SLO is both at Fanatics and at Gremlin and everything is it's not, um, it's less of a science and more of an art. So um, I'd almost be, not, not once say hesitant to retire an SLO, but I'd more really focus on tweaking it. It's kind of like, you, you know, the, the AC, you're never really, you know, especially with your, everyone's data, you know, you change it one and then everybody knows what happens. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of an example. <laughs> 